The next case to come before the court is State of Ohio v. Houston Freeman. Are both parties present? Um, the state has waived our argument. Okay. Very well. Uh, Attorney Bramke, then um, I would just let you know that you have up to 15 minutes to present your argument. Um, the arguments are being recorded, so please stay behind the podium and keep your voice up. Uh, also, uh, please avoid using the names of children, minors, or victims during your argument. You can refer to them by initials or generic terms. And we have read your brief, uh, and we are ready to proceed when you are. Yes. Good morning. It's still morning. Good morning again, um, judges Giovanna Bramke on behalf of Houston Freeman. Um, I have raised one assignment of error, and that's that the imposition of attorney's fees is contrary to law. Although I would assert to you that I've broken this first assignment of error down into four different reasons why it's contrary to law. The state has conceded at least to um, the fact that the attorney's fees cannot be assessed as part of the sentence. Should they have conceded to that, though? It says in the entry it's a civil sanction, which is what the law requires. The entry says this is a civil sanction and cites the case that you cite in your brief. The Taylor case? Correct. Correct. So, in this case, in, in this um, entry, is actually, I would assert to you, worse than um, Taylor. Because although it says that, number one, um, Taylor stands for the fact that uh, in Taylor is very specific as to these attorney's fees being assessed. and says it can't be part of the sentencing that it has to, um, that the best practice is, although I, don't, I agree that Taylor doesn't say it has to be, that there's a separate entry with regard to that. In Taylor, it was, the imposition was under an, a title, financial sanctions, and um, this is actually, I'm sorry, financial obligations in Taylor. And this, page three of the sentencing entry, is uh, states financial sanctions. But, but is it is that a, that provision under that heading? If you look at the actual entry, it's all the way to the other side of the margin, while everything else is the other way. It's, isn't it its own section? Um, no, I would say it's number five under there that um, that the courts under that same heading, the financial sanctions, that the court ordered the reimbursement of the attorney's fee. Uh, which is under that same heading. So I would submit to you that this is more egregious than the Taylor case. Um, and the again, the state has conceded that, and, and my assertion is that it can't be assessed for purposes of um, part of the sentence. Here, uh, the court ordered that and as part of the sentence. Clearly in violation of Taylor would be my assertion. Um, but even if this court isn't inclined to order that to agree with me on that first uh, argument, and again, it's all under the same assignment of error, there's three other uh, arguments here that I have made that it, um, is an assertion that the court cannot order attorney's fees as part of the sentence and that this was contrary to law. Number two was at the time, Lorraine County did not employ a recoupment uh, plan, which is required under OAC 12105. That is something actually that it's in the record that, that the um, that the that the county does, did not employ it at the time. That's something that the uh, defense attorney argued on the record. So subsequent to the imposition of attorneys and fees in this case, there was uh, the commissioners did pass a recoupment plan on February twenty fourth of this year, but. The recoupment plan was a prerequisite for the imposition of attorney's fees. So the recoupment plan is essentially under this um, administrative code is that the, you know, the county cannot collect from defendants and not repay to the public defender. So questions on that as well. Isn't there statutory authority, though, to impose that, that attorney's fees? You're talking about an OAC section. And is there any evidence in the record that Lorraine does, have, does or doesn't have a recruitment program? Yeah, I, I would submit to you that that's something that the, um, the defense attorney did argue on the record, that there was no recruitment plan and the state um, didn't dispute that at all. Um, you know, I would submit to you that it is an evidence that the, and it's 
um, not disputed that the that the county didn't employ a recoupment uh, plan. And again, that's a although statutorily the court can impose attorney's fees. Um, that's further clarified by the administrative code, which as a prerequisite, the county must employ the recoupment plan. Um, because again, you can't collect from defendants and not reimburse that back to um, the public defender. The county does not have that recoupment plan, which I think again is pretty telling that at the time it didn't have the recoupment plan and then after subsequent to this case, it does employ one. The third argument is that the court erred um, when it found that Mr. Freeman had the ability to pay. So much of the argument on the record relates to this ability to pay. Um, and it kind of is also in with the sentencing and the facts of the case as, as they are. Um, but some of the things that are in the record is uh, that Mr. Freeman has a very low IQ um, per the expert that was retained in this case. His IQ was notably low. His IQ was 67. Intellectual disability is usually defined, and this is on the record, as 70. It was debatable, 70, 69, or below, but regardless, um, Mr. Uh, Freeman was below the threshold for intellectual disability. There was, um, there was an assertion by uh, the defense counsel that he has a follower mentality that led to this offense, that he's not able or capable of making his own um, decisions, and that's why he has a follower mentality. And there was also an assertion, um, which I think is telling, because of, there's a lot of people that can parent that maybe shouldn't, but there was an assertion that the, he was too low of an IQ to even properly parent a child, which was relevant to this case. Um, and there was also a statement that Mr. Freeman would benefit from Murray Ridge, which is the Loring County Board of Developmental Disabilities. So it's clear that he has this intellectual disability and an inability to um, provide for um, or ability to pay. He, Was there a PSI um, for sentencing? I believe the entry does state that, yes. And if there was, I... I would have, um, I believe that there was a PSI. So there's probably some information in there about his work history, potentially. Would you uh, agree that the PSI could um, be used as evidence that he does have the ability to pay if he has a work history or if he currently has a job? I would assert to you that, that that's not um, what the trial court used here to determine. So the what you'll see in the transcript is that the trial court asked, hey, do you work? He said, yes, I've been working for three weeks as a landscaper. Um, and then the court immediately sort of went into this, well, I find that you're able-bodied, you're abil you have an ability to pay. Um, but the, you know, 2941.51D, um, you know, the, a person can only be ordered to pay the amount that the person is um, can is reasonably expected to pay. I would tell you that even if there is a PSI that talks about work history, that, that would not go into expenses. And this, um, while there is not a fact, set factors for ability to pay, Taylor acknowledges, and there's a post-Taylor case, State versus IV in the 6th District, that, that cites to Taylor, about this myriad, myriad of factors, basically that is a lot of factors, and there's not a set amount of factors, but for those factors, you know, according to OAC 121.05, would take into consideration the person's ability to pay their income, um, their basic living expenses, costs and expenses related to this case. So, so your, your position is in order for him to order that the attorney's fees be paid in increments as costs, there would have to be a numbers analysis. Correct, and just in exactly, um, you know, it, it, that's something that they're, they're it's, it's not necessarily related to work because, again, expenses or um, hardship are things that can be taken into con consideration. And I think the Supreme Court made it um, clear in the Taylor case that it wasn't just one factor, it's a variety of factors. So, just the court taking into consideration the fact that he's been employed as three weeks as a landscaper is not sufficient. What the record, and, and, and um, I should 
say that, that Taylor Clay said it has to be in the record, these issues. And what the record does reflect is that he has an inability to pay because he um, you know, has this low IQ, he doesn't have the ability to make his own decisions, he doesn't consistently have work, he's only been working for three weeks as a landscaper. And what the trial court says is, well, I find you're employed and able-bodied, but that alone is not enough to a certain ability to pay. So, again, I would submit to you that this is in violation of the Taylor case. Is that true in all cases or in just in this case? So, could it ever be true that if somebody's employed and able-bodied, that could be sufficient? Or is no. an assessment of, of other factors required? No, I think Taylor makes it clear. It's a variety of factors. Um, so, the ability to pay is not just contingent on employment or um, maybe even on income. But, you know, on rate of pay, hours worked, because even if you're saying... But I'm, it could be sufficient under a certain set of facts. I mean, you, you have to go through the factors, is yeah, what you're saying, but yeah. it could be sufficient. Under Potentially, but I, I, I can't fathom a situation in that regard because it, it's a variety of factors. So employment alone is not sufficient. Taylor makes that very clear. I understand. Yeah, so I, don't, I can't envision a, a possibility where employment alone would be enough to determine an ability to pay. I understand. Um, and, you know, in this, for example, in this case, there's, you know, no inquiry as to rate of pay, hours worked, so he could be working minimum wage for two hours a week as a landscaper. Um, that was not, there was not enough inquiry here, and the PSI is not going to reflect that either, um, that about the um, hours worked, the amount of work, amount of pay, rate of pay, the ability to afford basic needs. Um, expenses and expenses associated with this case particularly. Um, so that, the record simply does, just, does not reflect an ability to pay. Um, fourth, my argument is that um, the court, much like in a restitution situation, State versus Jones and there's other subsequent cases, where the court has to make a specific finding as to, at the time, the amount of uh, attorney's fees. So this entry is a void of that. Um, it doesn't say the amount of attorney's fees and I would submit to you that every single time it's not going to have that because at the time of sentencing the court wouldn't be able to calculate that because obviously the time is, you know, when you get paid hourly and the time is still running at the time of sentencing hearing, there's no ability to, um, you know, to make that finding. So what we know in the Jones case is you can't make a finding of restitution as to a specific, um, you know, as a general finding of restitution. You have to make it to a specific amount, and it has to be made at the time of sentencing. The same would be true in this case, um, that there needs to be a finding of a specific amount, and there simply was, was not one. The entry is very clear to that regard. Um, so, again, we would ask that you reverse as to this attorney fee issue. And I would, again, submit to you that the state has conceded on the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, counsel. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. Uh, the clerk of courts will mail that decision to you on the day that it is released. And the opinions will also be posted on the Ohio Supreme Court website.